Glad you're here. If, if there's still, is it a little loud? Am I going? Is it, um, if there's still kiddos, you can go ahead and uh, take them to their rooms. I think most of them maybe are, have gone to their spot. Good, awesome. Um, well, welcome. We're glad you're here. Welcome to first Wednesday on the second Wednesday. Um, we, uh, you've had a chance to submit your questions. Um, I think there's even some additional ones in here. So we, uh, I, I've, I briefly looked at, honestly, some of them. I have no idea what a lot of them are. And um, Andy, trusty Andy, Andy, check one, two, is gonna bring uh, these guys out. And Andy, and... Andy, uh, Andy, you, you, uh, you don't bring me all, you want to bring me the rest or whatever? Okay. Bring me all of us. We're just, um, Andy, how long have you been here at New Hope? Uh, uh, talk, talking to my mic. Like, uh, today? No, no, no. Well, Uh, yeah. Like, uh. Are you at 20 years? Almost. Almost 20 years in, um, February, I think. Something like that. So yeah, almost. And next, this upcoming February? Yep. It's 20 years. 20 years. Wow. How have you done it, man? How did you do it? So, were, uh, were any of you around when he started? Anyone else? Look at, look at the, wait, that whole table? Wow, look at that. Okay, so you remember a different Andy, the, right? The hair was, had gone, hadn't gone down yet, didn't migrate. A lot of hair. Right? Lot yeah, of hair. totally, totally. Um, uh, all right. So uh, welcome. This is a little different than normal in that we um, are, we're doing Ask Anything. So you had a chance to submit questions. Uh, we're just gonna go through these rapid fire as much as we can and, and one after the other. Um, so just to prove these aren't like preloaded, these are, can you see them? The, yep, these are your questions. Can you tell that these are yours? These are your, right? This is your handwriting stuff. Um, you know what was cool? There's probably like at least 10 that are written by, by kids. Or, or terrible handwriting, some of you. Uh, either way, uh, it's super cute. So we'll, uh, we'll get some kid ones in there. So um, let, me, uh, let me do this. Let me pray for us. We'll open and then we will go through it. And then uh, um, we'll just, we'll get into it. We'll see how this goes. First time ever trying this. So here we go. Lord, thanks for tonight. Thanks we can do this. Thanks that, that you've, um, you've given us uh, both a, a desire and an ability to know you and to know you in a deeper way. So help us this, uh, the, the, this evening. Uh, to grow in our faith, grow in our conviction, our understanding of who you are, um, but also our, in, in our appreciation and love for you. So um, help us in, um, uh, as, we, as we just discuss uh, all things faith and life in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so here we go. First one. Andy kind of put these in a little bit of an order. Okay, I didn't need this one first. Is he in here? You didn't need this one first. Okay, here we go. You ready? Yeah, yeah, just uh, shuffle a little. Uh, all right, here we are. First one. Oh, There's the rest of the I didn't need, I didn't, well, I was like, oh, that's a fun one. It wasn't, I didn't mean like oh. right out the gate. You here want, we go. No, no, it's, it's too late. It's too late. It's done. I, there's the, fun the, ones the, in the, there. the Lord has spoken. The Holy Spirit moved. Here it is. Ready? Do cavemen or Neanderthals or Homo sapiens account uh, for the individuals created in Genesis 1 6 versus Adam and Eve, introduced in Genesis 2? First question. Who, so, whoever you are, here we go, right? Uh, it's not done. Uh, versus uh, Adam and Eve, we were created in Genesis 2, who were specifically given the breath of life, i.e., what defines our humanity, and then another reference, uh, Genesis 2 7. Okay, have you guys ever thought about this? Oh, is it your question? Oh, okay. Uh, uh, by the way, these are anonymous, totally fine. Um, have, so have you thought about cavemen, right? And this, uh, even the idea of like, uh, you know, the, the supposedly the, uh, the oldest uh, uh, known uh, skeletal remains named uh, Lucy, uh, I can't remember what she dated at, but, but um, long before, long before at least the perceived um, date of Adam and Eve or at least the, the hypothetical potential date of Adam and Eve. Okay, how would you answer this? 
It's not a cop out. Really, I, I got. Uh, I told Andy this is a fun one because I've actually been doing um, just on just nerding out on my own with guys who um, reading guys and, and watching stuff on this. And um, there is so now I, I'm still I'm the jury's still out in my mind as to how this works. But there are a number of Christian apologists and good, I mean, like devoted, convicted Christians um, who do, scientific, scientists who do not believe that Adam and Eve were the first um, uh, hominoids, we could call them. That there were, that there were, like uh, i.e. Uh, Homo erectus before Homo sapiens, that there were Neanderthals that weren't as developed and that there is a, a, um, a, a species of man-like uh, hominoids or Neanderthals that, um, that predate Adam and Eve, but that Adam and Eve were the first made in God's image. See the difference? So this idea, like, like well, a lot of times what people say is like, well, if you believe in Adam and Eve, how do you explain the cavemen or Neanderthals or, uh, or these, these skeletal rain, remains that are far older than, than supposedly 10,000 years old? Um, well, the answer, uh, f- at least f- uh, to, if, you want, if, if, you, if, you, uh, if you feel there's a necessary, um, um, a necessary cause to, to synthesize both what we find and what we see in scripture is that, Adam and Eve were the first uh, homo sapiens, the first humans made in God's image, but it doesn't mean that they are the first that look like or are of our, of our kind. Does that, make, does that make sense? Right? Which is probably, and this is the, the way the explanation goes, which is also probably why they were far more primitive and not as developed and not as, uh, as um, uh, of the same intellect or conscious level as you or I, but are much more animalistic because they are probably just another species of creatures. Interesting, right? You've probably never thought about it. This person has, but you probably haven't thought about it. Um, and uh, so, so the answer, the answer is twofold. First, uh, if you are an old earth or a young earth, it will help you frame how you would answer this. A young earth means that the earth is between eight, probably closer to 10,000 years old. Um, old earth is that the, uh, the earth is about 3.5 billion years old. And it's, uh, you would look at the scientific evidence and say that's probably accurate. Um, so you got to make a, an initial decision as to the age of the earth and, you know, you can decide. Um, and then you find out wh- wh- where does this fit in then? And Adam and Eve are the first made in God's image, but it doesn't mean that they're the first even person looking creatures, right? Okay. Satisfied? There we go. Uh, Andy, what the heck, man? Yeah. All right. Let's find a kid one. Uh, No, we'll go in order. Here we go. Uh, In Matthew 24, 34, Jesus claimed that the world would end before that generation had passed away. Um, how do you explain this passage knowing that if you, if you allow it to be a metaphor or not literal, you open the entire New Testament to that type of reasoning? It's a great question. Let me read you, Matt, before we just get into it, let me read you Matthew 24, uh, 34. Here's what it says. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. And then Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Uh, <clears throat> Matthew 24 is all about the second coming of Jesus. He talks, it's, it's where we get a lot of our, um, um, our eschatology, certainly from Jesus's mouth. I mean, it happens in, in the other gospels as well, but Matthew 24 is like where it, I mean, if you read Matthew 24, it's like very specific. So when he ends and says, I tell you the truth, um, that, the, that this generation won't pass away till, till, um, till these things come to pass, there's, uh, there's, again, I'll give you two options and you decide you, as to which one is which. Uh, the first is a preterist view, which means that all of the end times passages happened in the first century. They happened around 70 AD at the destruction of the temple. There are a lot of Bible scholars who would look to this and say that, that um, even Revelation represents um, uh, the events of the, uh, the first century and that they are past and that they happened. They actually happened during the, the generation of those who were alive. And they're, they're, so you can, of course, certainly be a believer and, and take that view that, that, um, that, uh, uh, that literally the things that Jesus talked about happened during the generation of them. Okay, if you hold to a futurist view that, 
passages like this and those in Revelation and First Thessalonians and other passages are future. Um, how do you answer this then? All right. Jesus also says a, a, um, another thing specifically about John. He says, what is it to you? And then when they're asked like, well, what are you gonna do with this guy, right? And he says, what is it to you that um, if, uh, if I want him to stay until all of these things happen? This idea like, hey, what, if I want him to live until all, all of these things happen. And so um, another way that without being like, it, well, it all happened in the first century, another way to answer it is, well, it, it did all come to pass in John's vision in the book of Revelation. And he wrote it down and it occurred as a vision, but it, it, it showed us how it's gonna occur. And it happened, he got this vision during this generation, the first generation, does that make sense? And wrote it down so that essentially like, in, in God's timeline, it's happened. We have, it has, it's still future for us, but in God's eye, it, but like outside of time, it's happened and let me show you what happened. And he writes it and gives it to John and, uh, and he's, it's obviously written down and it's now in scripture. Does that make sense, right? So it isn't that the, it literally happened, though you can, if, again, if you have a, a preterist view, you would, you would say it's, it has all happened, but you can be a futurist and say, well, no, 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 all of these things, uh, all of these things did come to pass before that, gen that generation passed away, but it, it did so through vision and revelation and eventually um, written down into the book of Revelation. Good, make sense? Yep. Let's go, next. Um, uh, I have harmed someone on earth. I have repented my sin. God has forgiven me, but I never apologize to this person. Okay. So all of us. All right. If I meet this person in heaven, will there be a problem? <laughs> if it's me, yes, you and I will have a problem. Uh, why didn't you apologize to me yet? Uh, uh, I, I, this is actually a good question. The, the, the question is, hey, if there are issues that are between us, uh, like here on earth that aren't resolved, does that go into heaven with us? And the answer is maybe, maybe. Heaven isn't, um, heaven isn't like uh, in a, like our experience, like when we go to heaven, what we see in scripture isn't an, like our, our minds and memories get erased and we start over. It isn't like a redo or a reboot. Does that make sense? It's not like a wipe the hard drive and put a new hard drive in. And so like, you, like, like you don't get to heaven. I, I really truly believe this. You, you won't get to heaven. We see this to be true because people recognize each other, that they recognize Jesus, Jesus recognized people, but also we see uh, like uh, 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 views into heaven. We see people interacting and they know each other and they know what's going on. And so like, you, you won't get to heaven and be like, I, I, you know, like you see, like if you're, if you're married now, maybe you're married, maybe not, or maybe you have close friends and, and like you get to heaven and, and you see, you know, your, your spouse on earth at one, one point who was your spouse and, and you're like, I don't, do I, do I know you? You're, you're extremely attractive, man. Whoever, whoever was with you was, was a lucky guy, right? Or a lucky guy. Like, and like, man, I just feel a, a weird connection. And all these other little children, they look like, like you and me, what happened? Like, it's not like a, a memory wipe. So here's the real, I think the real question was being asked, will we remember anything bad that happened on earth? That answer is, is yes, absolutely we will. And the reason we know that is because in, um, uh, in Revelation, we see that there's, uh, there's a passage where John is writing about um, a, a view in a heaven. And we see that it says that those who are martyred for their faith they go to the Lord and they ask him. And this is what they say. These are people who are given white robes because of their testimony and they were killed for their faith. And they say, how long, O Lord, until we are, our, our blood is avenged? So here's what that tells us. They remember that they were killed. They remembered they were martyred and they also kept their sense of justice. All right, Lord, how long? How long till you write these wrongs, right? And the answer is a little longer, a little longer. There's a, in fact, there's a certain number that has to be reached. This is what we're told. So, so this idea that like, 
um, that we won't remember anything bad doesn't seem to be the case. What we aren't given is how it all works together. So how we can both have negative memories of what happened on earth, yet also still like, like um, the way uh, Randy Alcorn explains it in heaven is that the negative, like us remembering some of the negative experiences only heightens the fact that we are now in pure joy and with the Lord. And it's, it's, uh, it, it, uh, it increases our appreciation for who God is and what he's done because we remember some of the, the difficult negative stuff. So um, if I meet this person in heaven, will there be a problem? Maybe, depending on what it is. I don't know what the specific thing is, but it's, it isn't like you're gonna forget like, like all the bad things you've ever done, you, you are erased from your memory. But the problem though will be, I, I, I truly believe this, it'll be squashed as soon as you meet. Will there be a problem? Oh yeah. Yeah, in fact, the problem is we're reminded of the problem when we look at Jesus and we see his scars and the fact that we're all sinful. And then you meet this person and like, hey, I'm really sorry. I'm so glad you're here. Isn't this place awesome? Yes, let's go explore together, right? So will there be a problem? Uh, maybe, yeah. Will it be dealt with right then and there? Oh, oh, you bet. Like the problem isn't, all right, is it gonna be like a billion years that they're, bitter towards me? <laughs> no, I, I, in that moment, it's, I'm so glad we're all forgiven, right? So the stuff that we take into heaven comes with us, but also so does the forgiveness and grace. If you remember in Revelation, it says that, that um, in the end, um, at the end of Revelation, it says that, that, uh, that he will wipe every tear from their eye. This is an important phrase. It's, it's poetic, but it's also important. He doesn't say we won't cry, it actually says we will cry and he'll comfort us. That, we, that there will be a sense of, of crying and then a wiping of our eyes and then there's no more death, no more pain, no more suffering. So there's an initial like sort of a, a, a maybe regret, maybe, maybe like, oh my gosh. And then I, like, I, 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 I just didn't know. And, and then a, a wiping of the eye and then a, hey, come on in, you're here. <sighs> okay, good, here we go. What happens to people uh, who haven't heard or who were actively discouraged toward Christ? Uh, okay, this is three questions. So whoever you are, you cheated. All right, that's number one. Why doesn't God talk to us like he did in the Old Testament and the New Testament? Number three, why did God make Abraham go through the motions of sacrificing his son? All right, I don't know who wrote this. Uh, I'm gonna pick one of the three out of fairness to the other 200 people. Um, what happened? Which one do you want? Number one, two, or three? Okay, that didn't help at all. Uh, number one, say yay. Okay, number two? Number three? Wow, really? Number three? Okay, number three is why did God make Abraham go through the motions of sacrificing his son? Okay, so you remember the story? God uh, tells Abraham, hey, I'm gonna give you a son. And then uh, his wife laughs, like, are you kidding me? Like, look at us, like, look at us. Really, we're gonna have a kid? And uh, turns out she gets pregnant and is like, oh my goodness. Okay, they have this child. And then, uh, right, the prize child, like this is our one and only son. And, uh, and then he grows up and then they go and they're gonna do the sacrifice. They're gonna worship the Lord and there's no sacrifice that they don't take an animal. And Abraham says um, to, uh, to his son, hey, don't worry, the Lord's gonna provide, right? And it turns out that he is the one to sacrifice, to be sacrificed. And Abraham gets the knife. And as he's about to do it, an angel shows up and says, stop. Now that I know you were willing to sacrifice your son. I know, I truly know you were willing to do anything for me, right? And then he says, hey, look over here. And then over on the side is a ram who's, uh, this is really, this, is, it's, this whole story is actually really important. There's a ram whose, whose horns are caught in some thorns and that becomes the sacrifice. Okay. When you think of this story, not, not just as a, well, this really happened, but a, okay, what does this teach us? The story of Abraham and Isaac is a living illustration and, a, and an arrow pointing directly to the sacrifice of Jesus. It's a type, what's called a type in the Old Testament of, a, 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 of a, a, an experience that then represents what Jesus will do. So this entire story is the gospel presented in the Old Testament. And it's meant to then just to, to, to show you and even to expect like, hey, the whole, like the, from the beginning, the whole point was that God was gonna send something else to substitute the sacrifice on our behalf. 
Whoa, okay, so it's not about Abraham and Isaac. It's not, I mean, it is, but it's not just about a story about God doing this, but rather him setting up a moment to then point to a future moment where we have God's one and only son, just like Abraham's one and only son, ends up being the sacrifice, right? And, and in the story with, with, um, with Abraham, there's a, um, uh, to, to, uh, to replace his son, they're like, listen, it's not about child sacrifice. It's about a, 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 a living illustration to point to a future, like forever sacrifice. And, and the replacement is a ram who's caught in thorns. Are you kidding me? You kidding me? I mean, that's like, like you read that and then you read the crucifixion and you see like the, the fact that Jesus was given thorns and you go, wait a minute. This whole story was just one, it was like a, a, a real life parable for what was gonna happen where this other sacrifice who's also caught in thorns is gonna be sacrificed on our behalf. Does that make sense? Right, good, hope, satisfied? Okay, good. All right, wow, we got a lot of cards. Here we go. Okay. Let's take some time for this one. Okay, are you guys sitting down? This is from a child who signed it. Well, maybe mom signed it. Uh, I, I will I'll even share the name, Violet P, which is Purcelli, Violet Purcelli. She's not, she's not here, but she, she wrote this. Um, or, or Andy's handwriting is terrible. <laughs> Here's what she says. Uh, can, you, can you see this? Can church be longer? <laughs> yes. Yes, sweet girl. In fact, I can go twice as long, right? <laughs> Whatever you want. That's awesome. Uh, all right. Can you address the Crusades and how that time is relevant in church history? Um, the Crusade, so uh, I don't know what you mean by relevant with regard to like maybe why it happened or what does it mean? Um, the, the Crusades, uh, the, the Crusades show us what happens when, when religion trumps a relationship? So the, the crusades show us what happens when religion, even the Christian religion, gets out of control. Because no one will look at, like, no, like for you and I, no one will look at the crusades and say, they were, they were acting like such good Christians. Like they were, they were clearly following Jesus. Now, though they said they were, and it was all about like, like, like fighting and battle and like which, like, which, like which team's logo was on your shield, right? And, and like the cross was supposed to like give you victory. But, but like, the, like the crusades weren't what it meant to be a Christian. It was what happens when this whole thing gets out of control. When we actually like disregard the words of Jesus. So like the first example is um, when, uh, when Peter pulls out a sword, and he's like right in the, um, the, um, the garden and the night before, uh, the night Jesus was betrayed. And he pulls out the sword and he's like, let's go, right? I can, I can totally imagine this scene where they're coming to arrest Jesus and they show up and there's Judas, who's one of them. And, and they're probably like yelling at him, like, how could you? You're like, you're supposed to be on this side with us. And here you are and these Roman soldiers and he gives Jesus a kiss on the cheek and, and then they arrest him and Peter's like, Nope, not without a fight. And he pulls out a sword, right? And chops the dude's ear off, which is like, here's what that tells me. You're terrible with a sword because he probably wasn't going for his ear. He was probably like trying to like, actually hurt him. And he's like, ah, man, that's my ear. Like, what are you? And, and, Jesus, and Jesus is like, stop. He says, listen, stop. My kingdom is not one of the sword, right? He's like, put it away. What are you doing? What are you doing? And so the crusades represent if like, if, if, if sword Peter was in charge, that's what would happen. And what we see is Jesus saying, what are you doing? So the Crusades honestly really is a, a, um, a black mark on the, on the, the history of the church. Um, one that we would say, uh, uh, one that's often brought up and used against Christians, which is interesting, but it's also one of those things where it's like, do you, do you know when the Crusades happened? Do you know? Do you know? centuries ago, a thousand years ago, right? Uh, it, it, it's also unfair to say, well, because um, someone a thousand years ago took, took, uh, took up a sword in the name of Christ, therefore Christians today are also doing the same thing. Hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute. 
right? So um, how is it relevant in church history? It's relevant in that it happened and it also should show us that is not the way of Jesus. It's not the way of Jesus. We don't put on armor and go to battle in the name of Jesus um, to, to fight against uh, right, those we disagree with. Um, okay, good. Uh, are there any third-party texts that support the miracles of the Bible? Um, yes, in so much that they mention them, but they, they don't, uh, but they don't give, um, they don't critique them. They only say that people believe that they happen, this happened. So there's a guy, there's a, a number of first century historians. Um, uh, the, the main one is a guy named Josephus and he, and he's a Jewish historian and he writes about, um, uh, or how, how these, uh, how there's a, there's a, um, a new religion, a new cult, a new sect who call themselves Christians, who follow this guy, Jesus of Nazareth, who, who claim, this is what he says, who claim he was killed and rose again. It doesn't say that he was or wasn't, but rather that, that uh, this was the claim of the first early Christians. It's actually a really important statement that, that it shows from the beginning. This wasn't like, you know, some group of guys hundreds of years later creating some myth around Jesus and kind of rewriting history. From the first century, Century, it shows that the first Christians actually talked about a resurrection. That this, that they, it says they claim that he, this, that their, their savior rose again. And it even says that he was killed under Pontius Pilate. It's very specific. So it mentions, um, it mentions the, um, uh, the belief of miracles in the, in the first Christians. It doesn't, it doesn't claim right or wrong, just that they believed it. But that's extremely important. Does that make sense? Right? So there are, there's a number there, there, and then there's a number of historians that talk about it as well. Um, that's a cliff notes. Okay. Do animals go to heaven? Whoa, you guys are answering for me. Look at that. You guys, you know. Uh, uh, which animals? I think it's important, right? There are some that we're like, no, there's no way. There's no way, right? In fact, if they're there, I don't want to be. Some of you, some of you, if I was like, you know what, like my, my, one of my, not my favorite animal, but like I, I, and I hope you don't think less of me. I really love snakes. Yeah, see, I, I, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have, your, your view of me just went down. But some of you are like, are you kidding me? If there's snakes there, I'm out, right? I'm out. Um, uh, but if I said like, oh, but there's also probably, there's gonna be some horsies. Okay, maybe I'll come, right? <laughs> Uh, here's uh, the definitive, well, okay, I can say this. There is a, uh, a new earth and a new heaven and a new earth, right? Revelation talks about that. On the new earth are animals. It talks about it. It talks about the lion also living alongside the lamb and they don't eat each other. So there's at least lions and lambs, which would lead us to believe, okay, there's probably other animals, right? Why would, what, like, it's not only them. So there are other animals in this, this new heavens, new earth. Um, it, um, uh, when we think about when we think about what heaven is like, we could do I maybe mean, we should do a whole series on just heaven. Um, uh, it, what we see out of Revelation and and a lot of it is imagery. So we got to be careful with Revelation. Like you don't read Revelation and say, well, this is literally what happened. I mean, the whole thing is a vision. Just like you wouldn't say like you wake up from a dream, like a, the craziest, weirdest dream you've had, and go, I know what I'm supposed to do now. Right? I'm supposed to jump off this building and fly to the next one and then end up in a swamp. And you're like, what? That happened in my dream, right? Um, uh, but in this vision, we see animals coming from heaven. We see horses. This is why there's gonna be, this is why I said the horses. And you're like, oh yes. And we see a rider on a white horse. Oh, beautiful white horsey, right? And, and again, it's vision, but it's also, okay, listen, listen. Animals were part of God's creation originally. In fact, before us. So it would make only, it would only make sense that in the new earth, there's animals, that God made animals and loves animals and wants there to be animals that, okay, it, it makes total sense that there'll be animals in heaven, right? It would be weird for him to, 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 to kill off an entire, like, like everything other than humans would be an odd, um, it'd be an odd move on God's part to be like, hey, I love my creation, except all those little critters I made. I, I, I shouldn't have done that. Now, now, some, some like mosquitoes and stuff, like, Lord, we don't need those. We don't need them, right? Um, but will there be animals? I, I think so. Um, is there, 
is there a maximum amount of times God can forgive us for the same sin? What's the number? 12, that's correct, that's the answer. Sorry, so if you're close to it, be careful. No, the answer, okay, ready for this? It's, there's, two, there's two answers. You like how I give everything with two answers? It's, it's good. Uh, but they're both the same. The answer is, is there, a, is there a, a maximum amount of time God can forgive us for the same sin? And it, it, the, the short answer is no. Like you don't get to it like I've done it 14 times. That's it. You've had, you, there, you know, there's the 15th, 15th time is a charm. You know the saying, right? Sorry, you're, 15 strikes and you're out. <laughs> um, no, there isn't a maximum amount of times you can do one sin, but the amount of times he's forgiven that same sin is one. And that was on the cross. There's one time where he says, I'm forgiving it and it's done. This is why Paul can write in, in uh, Romans 8, chapter one, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It isn't, hey, at this moment, unless you sin again, there's no condemnation. But if you sin again, the 15th, 16th, 7th time, you gotta, you're back in the condemnation and you gotta work, you gotta figure it out. No, 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 it was dealt with. So the, the maximum amount of times God forgives a sin is one and it's on the cross and he deals with all of it and it's done. And a lot of us live with guilt and shame our entire life thinking like, I messed up again, I messed up again. And we repent and we ask for forgiveness and he says, it's yours, granted. Remember, I dealt with it. I dealt with it with Jesus on the cross. So it's done. So the answer is no there's, no, there's not a limited amount of times, but also one. Is that good? Good. Is the Catholic Big C Church, uh, or capital C Catholic Church, the church that Jesus instituted? Yes. No, just kidding. That, was, that would be a really quick throwaway. You didn't think that was as funny as I thought it would be. <laughs> um, the, um, okay. Oh. Am I going to say this really? There's two answers. <laughs> uh, if by Catholic church, you mean little c, uh, the Catholic literally means universal. That's what it means. So the Catholic church, meaning the universal church, the answer is absolutely. He started the church, the church, universal church, little c church. If by Catholic, you mean Roman Catholic church, that is a different uh, branch or variation of the church, Right? So is the Catholic Church, like with, like with the Pope and cardinals and, and priests and, that, and, and, and the, like the whole hierarchy set up, is that what Jesus, what Jesus instituted? Um, I mean, it, it took us a while to get there, but Martin Luther was the first to say, hey, we've gone astray here. We've gone astray. So the answer would be no. It wasn't the Catholic Church, and they would say like Peter was the first Pope, um, but rather the Catholic Church. And, and do, how many of us have a Catholic background? I'm gonna imagine quite a bit of us, right? And we probably have family that are Catholic. So this is like, it can be personal, very personal. You probably have family owners that are Catholic. Um, so is the Catholic church the one that Jesus instituted? He instituted the church. The Catholic church then um, became, it added traditions to it um, and, and kind of uh, added to the church, the essence of the church. But, but listen, that doesn't mean you can't be like, like Catholics can't be saved. It doesn't mean that if you go to a Catholic church, you're like, well, clearly you're doomed. No, no. I mean, it, we would say that like, it's, um, they've added to, they've added to what is expected. But like, I know, I know, I know plenty of people. One of, um, we, had a, we had a couple that was in our small group long, many years ago um, when we first started and they weren't to a Catholic church, but they were in our small group. And he and I would go out, you know, for, um, for dinner and stuff or just go hang out and chat and uh, all about faith and theology. And he loved Jesus just as much as any one of us. And he went to a Catholic church and he, he just loved the high church experience. And he knew that there was some other stuff added to it and was like, you know, I don't, I don't pray to Mary. And there's a lot of kind of other stuff that's a little weird, but he's like, but I just, I just want to worship my Jesus. And I do so at a Catholic church and I love the order. And I love the music. And like, who am I to say you can't know Jesus? And also, so that has nothing to do with the question, but there it is. All right. Uh, is the Catholic church, the church that Jesus instituted Roman Catholic no, universal church, absolutely. Honest, uh, all right. On a scale of nine to 10, how great is it working with Andy? 
That's legitimately the question, right? Uh, all right. It's, uh, I, you know, I would, I, if I'm going to put a number, uh, I would say a six and it's going down. Uh, how is it that the wisest man on earth, was that really mean? No, it's good. It was, it, was, it, was all, it was all in good, good fun, right? Except I meant it. Uh, not, not at all. How is it that uh, the worst man on earth, or the wisest man, ooh, that's not it. Uh, how is it that the wise, that's two different things. How is it that the wisest man on earth, Solomon, supported polygamy with 300 wives and 700 concubines? It's probably proof he wasn't absolutely wise. He was the closest to it. Um, you, know, you know what's funny? I was actually listening to a thing today um, specifically. Um, it wasn't about Solomon, but it was about polygamy and how, we, how, um, how our understanding of polygamy, uh, or at least the, the, the Bible's perspective of polygamy, we assume it says one thing, but it actually says the opposite. We assume that it, uh, it condones and approves polygamy because it's in there. And it is all over the Old Testament. But what we don't realize and, and uh, what this guy was saying which I'm like, I, of course, absolutely, is, uh, is every time it's mentioned, ready, listen to this. Every time polygamy is mentioned and described in the Old Testament in their experience is a miserable experience. It's a miserable experience. It's never like, this is how it should be. This is great. It's, hey, this is what they did. This is what happened. And here's the fallout. And so like the Bible is not pro-polygamy at all, it, but it, it did happen. And it describes polygamy. So um, Solomon, the wisest man on earth, um, polygamy with 300 wives and 700 concubines. Um, without getting into it too much, not all, like when you think of 300 wives, it isn't like, like your spouse. Like if you're married, guys, you have, you have a wife. It wasn't like, hey, add 299 more of those. What a life, what a life. A lot of these wives were political alliances with other, like this is how you got an alliance with, with a neighboring country. It was like, all right, you take my daughter into your kingdom and part of your experience and your palace. And then it's like this sort of like, hey, I'm not gonna attack you. You're not gonna attack me. Your daughter's now living with us and we're not gonna. And so it was, this, it was very much political. So it wasn't like, don't think of it as like, he's like, like every night he's spending the night at a different house, like 300 houses in the year. And he's like, this is getting old quick. Like I'm tired. That's not it, this at all. That wasn't this experience. Now, um, if like you and I, like we get to heaven, we're like, hey, Solomon, would you do it again? <laughs> if you, do you do it over again? Would you do it again? He'd probably, he'd probably say no comment, depending on who's around him. If some of the wives are there, you know, I don't know. So uh, why, did, why did he do it? He was the king. This is what you did. Um, but it, it did not go well. And please don't try it. Um, <laughs> Why does the God of the New Testament seem so different from the God of the Old Testament, i.e. Old Testament incites violence versus New Testament? Jesus tells Peter to put down his sword. How did you know I was gonna say that? Uh, Old, uh, Old Testament, God establishes rules and demands obedience at the penalty of death versus New Testament, Jesus, uh, Jesus chastises the Pharisees for being similar. Okay, you answered your own question and maybe you don't even know it. The difference is this guy named Jesus shows up. The Old Testament is how we follow, how do we try to find God and serve God and, and obey God by doing the rules. And the whole point of the Old Testament is you can't. You can't. Here's, here's what it means to be righteous. And, and every one of them falls and falls short and, and creates just all kinds of problems for themselves, for their families, for their cultures, for, for their generation. And then they have to repent and turn to God and there's this huge cycle. And then Jesus shows up and what we see now is, is sin is dealt with definitively and now it's all right, hey, listen, that whole cycle of the like, hey, do this and then you messed up and then you gotta undo it and then try to redo it. This whole cycle of sin and, and sacrifice and stop doing and repent and do and generation after generation, listen, Jesus puts to stop to all of that because now it's done. What you were trying to do, Jesus has now done. So now it's grace. 
It's grace. Now it's just living in the, the new covenant that he starts. Does that make sense? So the new covenant supersedes, doesn't, it doesn't erase or do away with the old covenant, but it supersedes it in that our new covenant now is grace under Jesus. And, and if Jesus hadn't come, we would still be doing sacrifices in Old Testament and trying to sacrificial lambs and, and, and pigeons and, and goats and, because it was, this is the way to do it. But Jesus comes and he does away with all of that. Make sense? All the punishment we should have got goes to Jesus. Good. Uh, what is the correct authorship of the book of the Hebrews? Paul, Apollos, or Barnabas? Uh, I'll tell you in heaven. We don't know. We don't know. Honestly, we don't know. Um, uh, I don't think it was Paul, although a lot do, and maybe you do, and maybe you're going to leave this church now because I said that, and I apologize. <laughs> But I don't think it was Paul because Paul puts his name on every other letter. Why would he not put it on this one, right? He opens every letter with Paul, the apostle of so-and-so. And, the, and, and even though it, there may be some crossover, like um, um, the, the, um, the argument in Hebrews is very different. It's, it's, uh, it's much more Jewish, though Paul was writing to Gentiles and his, his outreach was very much to, uh, uh, became about reaching the Gentiles. Um, Hebrews is very Jewish um, and, and, uh, and the writing style is different. So it, it probably wasn't Paul who, who, who it was. I, I, you could, I could be argued that it was Apollos, um, probably not Barnabas, because he, he would have probably mentioned that who he was, probably with Paul as well. So the answer is, that was a, a long way to say, I don't know. Uh, uh, will all believers live in heaven or earth, the new earth, for eternity? Uh, that's a good question. Um, in in uh, the end of Revelation, what we see, it says that the... the um, that the, um, the new Jerusalem, the city, the heavenly city comes down as a bride dressed for the groom to earth. And that we, what we see, and, and, and again, this would be um, certainly N.T. Wright's view. He writes extensively on this, that heaven and earth, the new heaven and new earth actually join together. And it says that, and God will, be, God will come and live amongst his people and he will be their God. And so what we see is new heaven and new earth actually join together in one place that we all live. So will we live in heaven or earth for eternity? Both. Awesome, right? Okay. Will all people who, uh, who believe in the Lord live with him on earth during the thousand year reign? Uh, will all per people who believe in the Lord live with him on earth during the thousand years. Okay, I got it. Um, oh, maybe. Again, this, this, is, this is so hard because it depends with your view of eschatology. So some would say that the, and I don't believe this, but this is an option within Christianity, that the thousand year reign is, um, uh, is a, a metaphor for a long period of time. And it's actually talking about the time we're in now, that we're in it. If you're, a, a, i.e., a, like a what's oh, called a preterist, that you believe it all kind of already happened, and now we're in the thousand-year reign, and it represents the church age. You can believe that, and and certainly be within the faith. There are plenty of biblical scholars and and commentators who who who, who do, and there's actually a lot of like credible evidence for like why they believe what they believe. Um, for those who are futurists. Um, uh, Will all people who believe? Not all people, because there is a resurrection at the end as well. So there will be believers living there as well, um, but not all do. And then at the end of the thousand years, what we see is that there's still a rebellion. There's still a group of people who are like, I don't want this. If you remember the, if you, if you can recall to the, um, uh, in Revelation, when it talks about this, it says that, that, that Satan is loosed and again, and that there's one final battle and he gathers up the people um, uh, who then follow him, which tells us that there are people who are even in the thousand year reign who are like, uh, yeah, uh, Satan shows up, all right, I'll go with him. Somehow there are still people who are like, all right, I know the Lord's here, but like, I'm over this. I don't wanna be a part of this. So um, will all people live with him? Uh, all people who believe, no, not all people, but also not all the people who are alive will believe. Does that make sense? Okay, that, we'll move on. Okay. How was God made? <laughs> it's great. Another, uh, maybe another kid, I don't know. Uh, what do you think? Um, this, is a, this is actually a, a pretty d profound question. Um, uh, it's, this, is, this is hard for us to think about because we know that everything that exists had a beginning. 
And we would say, God exists, so he had a beginning. How did he start, right? And, and the only, here's the thing, that what we have to, like a distinction we have to make is that um, everything that exists in time, space, and matter had a beginning, right? Everything that exists in time, within time, has a beginning. If God exists outside of time, and we, he literally created time and, and um, uh, whether, like, d- depending what we think of it, time is, and there's um, philosophically and, um, and even scientifically, like, we're still not even sure what time is. Like, what is time? What is it? I don't know, right? And, and, and we can philosophize all about it, but it, like, is it a dimension? Maybe. Is it, a, uh, uh, is it, uh, is it um, an illusion of movement? There's a lot of philosophers who would say that's what time is, maybe. Whatever time is, God started it. So God exists outside of time and space and matter. So, so he doesn't have to have a beginning because he started everything with the beginning. Does that make sense? Which is why we say God is eternal. So he didn't have a beginning because he exists outside of time, somehow, some way. And it's so hard for us to even think about it, but that's... that's that's how it works. All right. Wow. We've got a few more to answer. Uh, there's no way we're going to get through these. Maybe uh, any good ones that you guys have that we haven't answered? You're going to say all of them, right? Yeah, all of them are good. Um, uh, uh, okay, that's... Uh, uh, oh, this is a fun one. Have you heard of the God gene? Yes, there's a book called The God Gene um, written by a guy named uh, Hammer, I believe is his last name. Hammer, Ham, Hamas, something like that. And so he wrote a book um, and he, uh, it was his attempt to try to discover um, a, genetic, uh, a genetic reason or uh, evidence, genetic evidence for the soul in people, in our genes. And he hypothesizes, um, given the research, that there is a gene that makes us um, what he would say is um, more inclined to believe in the supernatural or susceptible to believing the supernatural. And he's, he's neutral in his statement as to, um, as to whether it's true or not, whether there is a supernatural or not, but rather that there's a gene... Um, Okay, it's, uh, I think it's called like the VMAT2 gene. I may be wrong in the, specifically, but it's, it's close enough. I think it's the VMAT2 gene. And, and this gene um, uh, that, uh, that is identified in people is the thing that makes us prone to spirituality or at least believe in something more spiritual. Uh, it's also um, debated both by theologians and other scientists who would say that there's, this, isn't, this is based on one small study. It wasn't peer reviewed. Um, so, so there's a lot who would say like, no, that there isn't a gene that makes us spiritual. It just seems to maybe even if he's right. Now, here's, here's the, the question was, have I heard of it? The answer is yes. So technically we've answered the question. But if, what, what do we do with this? All right, the God gene. If it's true, does that mean that we that all of our spirituality is simply a, a result of uh, of our genetic mutation over time? That we that we literally like you and I, us believing in God is simply because it's in our DNA. It doesn't even mean it's true. We think it's true. We want to believe it's true because we're coded in our DNA to believe it because of this. I, I, I'm pretty sure it's the VMAT too. You someone Google it and let me know if I'm right or wrong. Um, and, and, uh, and, so, um, and so he says, like, it, this seems to be the case. Now, uh, even if he's right, and I don't, it doesn't seem that he is, but even if this guy is right, all it does is prove that even genetically, even genetically, God was ahead of the curve. And here's what, here's what it would mean. I don't think it's right, but even if it is, it means that God literally put in our DNA a desire to look for him. Isn't that crazy? If there is a God gene, this, and, and he even says that it's a, it's a terrible title, title for his book, um, that, that even if there is a gene that makes us pursue the supernatural, he says, this isn't even a problem for theologians because this just simply means that, that God put in our DNA, our DNA a desire to search for him. Ooh. Sometimes we call this the, the God-sized hole in your heart, right? Which is a, a funny way to, to put it, that we all have this like need for fulfillment 
in, that, that is only found in God. And if he's right, then this, would, this need would even go down into our DNA. Interesting, right? Hmm. So this isn't a threat to faith, um, even though it, it doesn't seem to be the case. Um, even if it were proven definitively, it still wouldn't be really a, a threat or an issue. Um, can evolution and, and Christianity coexist? We just talked about this on Sunday. So you get to go do your homework uh, on our website. Go rewatch that. Uh, that's great. Uh, all right. Man, we got a lot. Okay. Um, uh, oh, okay. Here we go. This is great. We're dinosaurs, once vegetarian. <laughs> huh. Interesting thought, right? Technically, a lot of them always were, <laughs> right? Herbivores. <laughs> oh. Again, that, that's a funny joke, guys. Uh, I'm, guessing, I'm guessing you're saying like all dinosaurs, meat eaters, right? Okay, old earth, young earth. Depending on what you believe, it d- determines how you answer this question. Let's assume, let's just assume that the, that the age of the dinosaurs are right in the you know, hundreds of millions of years. Uh, right or wrong, one day we'll know. Um, all right. Uh, here's, the, here's the issue that I, th- I, I think this is like what would be the theological issue, the problem. If dinosaurs existed millions of years ago, before Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve sinned, and that's when death entered, did dinosaurs kill each other pre-Adam and Eve fall? See, you see the, the dilemma? Was there death before Adam and Eve? And, like dinosaurs eating other dinosaurs. Um, if you reread Genesis chapter one, and this may be controversial, I don't think it is, um, but it's, it's very nuanced. It doesn't, it doesn't, talk, it doesn't describe um, that, that when they sin, uh, death in general began. What happens in Genesis chapter one is that when they sin, God tells them that they will surely die. Death to humanity enters. Does that make sense? Because there's a distinction. Death to plants. What, like, did, did, did plants die? Did animals kill each other or eat? You know, like, did, did, uh, did blue whales eat, you know, plankton back in, you know, pre-Adam and Eve um, in which there's death? I, I, you know, I, possibly. So if, if, uh, if dinosaurs existed millions of years ago, which we, you know, you could, believe the A, we can debate over the age, sure. Um, uh, they certainly, they certainly would have still eaten each other and, and it still allows for Genesis 1 and 2 to, to be entirely accurate, that death entered the human race through Adam and Eve. Does that make sense? Good? All right, good. Um, what scripture supports women elders and pastors? Okay. Two things. First, uh, please don't split this church over this question, all right? Let's not split over this. Number two, that's uh, three things. Number two, this is an unofficial question card that you wrote this on. This is just an index card, okay? (laughs) Technically, this is not a question, so let's not. No, just kidding. Uh, So the third one, really, um, the the scriptures that support women elders and pastors. Um, We don't see... um, uh, we don't see examples of women with the title pastors or elders, but we don't see many examples. What we're told is that there's that, uh, for instance, in Timothy, that Paul tells him, "Hey, um, you need to uh, you need to um, to raise up and uh, and assign elders." And here's the descriptions of the elders. Uh, this question, uh, if countless books have been written on, and it would be honestly, I, I don't want to dodge it, but it would be it would be really hard to answer in like you know, five minutes, the, um, the debate between um, like women in ministry. Um, uh, there seems to be three, three areas, okay? Not two, so I'm gonna add it. Here we go. There's not two answers. There seems to be three. Uh, number one, women should never be allowed to, uh, to, ass- to assume the title or role of pastor or elder or teacher in any circumstance ever. 
There are a lot of churches who fall under that, a lot, right? There's never an instance where uh, a lady should be in any type of leadership. Uh, option two, uh, um, women can serve in any, in any role a man can, any role, whether it be as a pastor or as a, a ministry leader, as a, even as a lead pastor, any role, that's option two. And there are plenty of churches who fall under that. And then there seems to be a third in which women can be in ministry roles um, and, and even as pastors, um, but, uh, but are limited to the role of the lead teaching pastor of a church. And that would be the position that, that a lot of people would point to Paul and say, I don't, have, I don't permit a woman to, um, to lead or teach over a man. And, and the, the, debate over, the debate over this issue is if Paul is outlawing one thing or two, that's all it is. Is he outlawing women leading and teaching? Like as, as like one thing, they can't, they can't lead and teach? Like one role as the lead teacher? Or they can never lead or teach? See the difference? Maybe you don't see it? Okay. They're not allowed to lead in any role or teach in, every, in any role. They cannot be on a stage or, you know, if there's a man in the room, they can't ever teach. Or is he saying they can't be leaders and teachers? Where it's, it's one thing. They can't be the lead teacher. Now, depending on how you understand that verse and how you understand the Greek, and again, there's commentaries and books written all about this, that will determine your view on this particular issue. Does that make sense? Now, you all want to know what I think, don't you? Well, you're going to have to wait on that. Uh, no, I'll tell you. You want to know? Okay, that was very uh, un unenthusiastic. So, all right, we can move on. Uh, okay. How should, uh, oh, how should Christians think about homelessness? I don't know the question. Uh, Jesus was homeless. So is, is, if the question is like, how should we respond to the homeless? Um, that's one thing. Um, uh, um, the, uh, we could say this, Jesus identifies more with the homeless than he does the rich, which by the way, is probably us, right? Like we are all within, if you own a home, you are in the top 1% of the history of the world. In, with regard to your wealth. Uh, Jesus didn't own a home. So how should Christians think about the homelessness? Um, I think it, it certainly is compassion, um, not as a nuisance and as, uh, as people who even Jesus would say, um, like when he says to his disciples, uh, when I was, uh, when I was uh, naked, you clothed me. When I was hungry, you fed me, right? And he goes through this whole thing and like, when did we do that? And he goes, when you did it for the least of these. So when we, our approach to the homeless should be, man, like how would Jesus treat this person right now? All right, that's probably how we should do it. All right, is that good? Um, oh man, uh, that's a really long one. Does, okay, does the, does the consensus on the evangelical doctrine of baptism state that baptism is purely symbolic and contains no spiritual transformation to the individual? the consensus on the evangelical doctrine. There is no consensus on the evangelical doctrine. All right, next. Uh, no, I don't want to throw that away. Uh, uh, the away. Is the question, is it just symbolic or is it spiritual? And again, you, there, there's opposite ends of the spectrum here. Um, I fall somewhere in the middle that it is symbolic, but it's simply, it's more than that. That there, this is a, like, um, I remember if you guys have been baptized, anyone, anyone you've been baptized? Raise your hand, we've been baptized. Good, good. Okay, anyone's hands not up? We're coming for you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, look, we're, we're, we're ready. We're ready, right? We could do it tonight. Anyone, you wanna do it tonight? Well, I'll dunk you right now. Let's do it. Um, uh, um, baptism is much more than just simply like, hey, I'm getting wet and look what I did. It really is, here's why it's, I, I really think that there's some, spiritual, there's some spiritual implications attached to it because it's an act of obedience to what Jesus is calling us to do. It's one of two ordinances. Just like we would say um, the Lord's table, communion, is much more than just like, you know, a snack. It's much more than just having a little drink and a little meal. We're like, no, 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 this is a, this is a moment we're having. 
just like that as an ordinance, so baptism is like, hold on, hold on, this is a moment. So baptism is, is more than just symbolic, um, but it's not, it's not salvation. It's not like how you, like you get baptized and then you're saved. That uh, I think we can argue definitively is not true. All right. Um, when driving to Portland, okay, hold on. I have not read this one. When driving to Portland, I'll pass a big church with a tall cross in front of it by the name of uh, Creation Christian Church. Okay, sorry, if that's your church, do I hope we're not throwing you under the bus here. On their sign is, okay, let me read this silently. Talk amongst yourselves. What do you, you know, you guys, how was your day today? Good, tell them. <laughs> Okay, okay. On there, uh, so, uh, okay, I, let's not throw under the show. On this unnamed church, <laughs> their sign, uh, on their sign, they display a Christian flag along with a rainbow flag. Theologically, how does that work? All right. Um, uh, I'm gonna guess, uh, I'm making an assumption here, that they are probably, they probably identify as what we would call an open and affirming church, meaning that, that they are open and affirming of uh, LGBT as a, as, a, um, as a natural means for how God designed people to relate. That's what I'm gonna guess they're saying. So theologically, they would hold to uh, that, uh, that LGBT and, um, uh, um, and, uh, and homosexual relationships are by God's design and, and just as good as, uh, and blessed as heterosexual. Does that make sense? So theologically, that's where they land. I'm gonna guess that's why they have the flag. I've never talked to them. I might be assuming a lot. Uh, it, maybe, they're, maybe, maybe in Sunday school, they're doing a lesson about Noah's Ark and they just had a rainbow up. But I'm gonna guess that, um, they're, that, that they're, they're saying we're open and affirming. That's what that means. Okay. Uh, hold on. Okay. Wow. How much? It's seven o'clock. Should we keep going? We got a few more in us? Uh, okay, I, I was gonna debate, do, we wanna, do you wanna have like Q&A like in response to anything or just keep going through some of these? Just keep going? Okay, keep going. Okay. Uh, um, thank you. Well, I've only got 50 more, so we might need to get the food back out for breakfast. Um, Do you, I, I, uh, I don't understand what that, I can't, sorry. Okay. Do, uh, oh, this, okay, there's another good one. This actually is a good one. Uh, there's another child. I'm gonna guess it's the same handwriting as previous. So this is Pastor Andy. Did, <laughs> did uh, Noah, spelled N-O-W-E, Andy, I'll talk to you later about Noah. Uh, did Noah take dinosaurs with him? That's cute, right? Um, okay. Uh, uh, d- 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 <sighs> There's two options. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's great. Um, okay. Uh, so, old earth, old earth. No, it's not possible, right? Dinosaurs were 100 plus millions of years ago. Uh, Noah was in the thousands, so there's no, there's no way. Young earth means dinosaurs were a part of God's creation and they were, um, they were in the, during the flood. Um, if, they were, if they were taken on the ark, we would see them now. Um, most, the argument for young earth would be that they died out. Most of them, if not all of them, died out in the flood. I'm also aware if you go to the creation museum and you go to the ark, there's a display and they're like, dinosaurs were here and they have a whole reason, a whole explanation. I struggle with that because where are they now? Where are they now, right? The whole idea with the ark was here's the animals God wants to uh, maintain and keep alive. Um, if they were on the ark, uh, um, we would see them or at least we would have evidence post ark um, certainly remains. So we can debate that. Did, did Noah take dinosaurs with him? Uh, I don't know. If you believe that like current day birds are dinosaurs, then sure. Uh, all right. If God created everything, who or, who or how was God created? Okay, I think we talked about that one. All right, he wasn't. Um, 
Why do we pray for peace if we know the world will need to get worse before Jesus comes back? Okay. So this, this is a uh, half glass full kind of person, sounds like. Um, uh, the, answer, the answer is this. We always want more peace, though we know it might and will get worse. It doesn't mean we, we give up on it, right? Um, it doesn't mean like, even, even though we know if, if we're a futurist and we believe the revelation is future and there really will be a time of tribulation and it's gonna get crazy, um, that doesn't mean we want that now or that we want things worse now. We really do pray for peace for as long as it can be and see as many people come to know Jesus and we don't want conflict. We want, uh, we want the way of love and grace and goodness. And then when Jesus comes back and it becomes judgment, okay, here we go. But in the meantime, absolutely, we want peace, peace, more peace. Um, uh, uh, during the millennium, will we understand all languages, universal gift of tongues, um, or will we start to speak one language? Uh, uh, the, there's two options. No, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Um, the real answer is we don't know. We're not told how we will communicate. We don't know. Um, uh, um, uh, I think Randy Alcorn in his book, Heaven, he talks about the possibility of a, a, almost like a universal translation in which we speak our language, but, but they hear theirs and vice versa. And so it's not we all speak one new language, though maybe it is, but, but, but to keep our, even our national identity, that there's all, that there's, because what we see in, in scripture is that there's, there's people of every, let's remember this, every tribe, tongue, and nation. If we get rid of languages, then there is no more like, well, you're of that tongue, or you're of that language. So there's a sense in which we keep our identity as every, every tribe, tongue and nation, but yet somehow we can still understand each other. How that works, we'll find out, but we probably will still keep our language as a marker and identifier of, of the, 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 um, uh, the multicultural kingdom of God. Make sense? Just like you won't lose like your nationality or like your skin color won't change just because you're in heaven. Uh, it would make sense to say we, our, our language wouldn't change either. Um, Will the universe outside of our solar system exist after the millennium? Uh, ooh, another good question. Um, maybe. Probably, but it will be different. It will be different. Um, I think Randy Alcorn, I keep referencing in his book because all these questions he, he talks about in his book, it's a really big book called Heaven. And, um, and he talks about this as, as even the possibility of space exploration in heaven and the new earth. That, that like, it isn't like God, God created the universe just to then remove it all, but like keeps it all. But our experience of it might be different. Just as in, um, in Revelation, it says there's no longer any sun, that like our star he isn't used to light up the planet anymore. And it says that the glory of, the, of God will illuminate everything. So it's like, like, like our experience of the solar system will be different because God acts as the sun, as the illuminating force, but that doesn't mean that there won't be one. So will the universe outside of our solar system exist? Um, I, I see no reason why it wouldn't. No reason why it wouldn't. All right. We got two more minutes. How many can we do in two minutes? Two, that is really helpful. I, I, I think we can get through a half of one. Can someone who... Uh, okay, can someone who has, who, has, who has passed affect earth from heaven? Does heaven time pass the same as earth? Um, okay, can someone who has, who has passed, I'm guessing who has passed away, affect earth from heaven? Uh, the, 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 the simple quick answer is no, at, at least it, 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 there seem, other than Jesus, there doesn't seem to be um, uh, an example of this. In fact, what we see, like Jesus talks about a parable that it's, it's much more than a parable. It's, it seems to be kind of a, um, almost a window into, into the afterlife. And he talks about, um, he talks about a rich man um, and Lazarus and uh, and the rich man goes to hell and Lazarus goes to heaven and that the rich man says, oh, oh, please, if I could just have a drip of water and my, just, just, a, just a drop of water. And, and, and then G, what Jesus says is, is that that can't happen because 
there is a great chasm between the two that they can't affect each other. Where you are is where you are, and that's it. And then he says, all right, fine. If, if no one can come to me, can I, can I come back and tell my family about this place so that they, and, and Jesus uh, and the famously says, if, um, if they don't believe me, they won't believe. Even if someone comes back from the dead, they won't believe, which is a foreshadow of, of hey, don't worry, I'm gonna do that too. And they still won't believe. So, but what we're told, what we're shown is that there is not an ability to like pass between them. So like, can someone from heaven come and like help influence like what's going on on earth? It do, that doesn't seem to be the case at all. Uh, aside from God um, um, specifically interacting and making it so. Um, but even then it's like, it's debatable. Does heaven time pass the same as earth? Yes. Um, but we don't age the same. Does, does that make sense? There's two instances in the Bible where, uh, where it talks about time in heaven. Uh, um, once is when one of the seals are ripped in Revelation. Um, and, uh, um, and it says that there was a, a, a silence in heaven for 30 minutes, for a half an hour. So he, he gives a time, 30 minutes. Oh, so, so time exists, at least in somehow like of a similar reference to ours. And then what we also see is that at the end, that the tree of life, it bears fruit. And it says this, it bears fruit every, oh, it's either two or three months. Can't remember the number. Every two months. Oh, so there's seasons. There's seasons of, in which trees like grow and bear fruit. So, so it, we at least have some sense that like time in heaven will be of a similar experience to what we know somehow. But that doesn't mean like, like if you think like our natural like conclusion of like, well, okay, you know, when I'm a hundred years old, I'm like in heaven, am I just going to keep going downhill? Like heaven's not like hundreds, hundreds, not the end. That's just like the beginning, right? Um, uh, the answer is no. Um, what will it look like? Um, uh, again, I, I'll re reference the book Heaven. Randy Alcorn, he theorizes, he doesn't say explicitly, he theorizes that it's possible that we, uh, this is both good news and bad news, uh, that, that we will be our peak selves at our peak, like um, uh, the, the age in which we are at our best, which he says um, uh, biologically is this, okay, don't, don't be upset with me, just the messenger. 29 and a half is what he says. So... If that was a few years from you, uh, where you are now, um, you might be past prime, just a little bit. Uh, so um, how, how will we age in heaven? Uh, uh, we, we probably won't, but there still will be time, if that makes sense. Um, okay. It's 717. So let's do this. Uh, we're gonna end here. Um, uh, okay. Would this be worth doing again next month? Same thing or switch it up or switch it up? Maybe I'll have same thing. Okay, I'll answer the rest of them. Well, here's what'll happen. Next time you'll come and there'll be like 50 more questions, uh, which is fine. We'll just get through it. So I'll keep these. And, uh, and if we want to do it again, great. Um, uh, I'm, I'm gonna, I'll think about this because I, all right. Do you guys like this? Is this good to be able to just be like, here's questions, we're just gonna go through them? Okay, we just spent an hour and a little bit going through question after question. Uh, I, I truly apologize if we didn't get to yours. Um, there really was no order. We just sort of like, let's just go through these. So um, if yours didn't get answered, uh, you can come talk to me afterward or you gotta come next month and we'll do it again. Let me pray for us. And then you, if you have kids, you can go get them and then um, we'll wrap up. So Lord, thank you for... Um, Thank you that we can know uh, answers to, uh, to honest, deep questions and, and not easy ones. Um, and, um, and, that, uh, and that, Lord, you've given us, you've given us a mind. And, and, and uh, Jesus, when you say the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God, um, we're pretty good at, at, at three of those. Um, and this, this exercise is maybe, is maybe increasing our, uh, our effort in our exercise of the fourth one. We're, we're told to love the Lord your God with your, with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, and often we neglect loving you with our mind. And this falls under that category. So will you help 
Will you help us continue to love you with our mind and even our ability to think through um, uh, big questions and difficult things so that we can better understand who you are and what you've done for us um, and what you are like. So Lord, we thank you for tonight. Um, I, we, I, I thank you that for this church, that uh, for your church, uh, Jesus is the head of this church. We pray that we would continue we would continue to, uh, to share the gospel and see uh, more people come to know you um, because, because of, uh, of the work you're doing in your people. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.